So this is the Burkina Faso case study, and that's joint work with Knut, uh, who's sitting uh, here, and Ode. And you can see from the title, it's a paper about demographic forces. I'm not a population pessimist, so I say that from, but there's a demographic issue here in this country case study. So let me start with this figure. What you see here is uh, the evolution of GDP per capita in real terms between 1994 and 2011. And you see that overall, that's quite a steady, sustained growth, right? There's, I mean, pushed in the beginning by the devaluation of the CFA franc, and then you know, there are a few interruptions due to droughts, food crisis, and so on. But it's overall, it's quite sustained. Right? So you would expect quite substantial poverty reduction. So if you look at the poverty headcount, and these are these red boxes, you see that uh, in the beginning it's increasing. Well, that's mainly due to this drought, because the 1998 survey was done right after this drought. So it's really the effect of that. Then to 2003, it's uh, declining quite substantially, but also not uh, too impressive. I mean, it's, after all, it's almost 10 years. And then if you look further to 2009, you see uh, a mild decrease in poverty. Yeah, so compared to GDP, that's not so impressive. And indeed, if you compute the gross elasticity of poverty, you find a value of uh, minus 0.5. So this is, say, by international standards, this is not a lot. There's, of course, a huge variation across countries in this elasticity. But we are definitely at the lower tail of that distribution. Right? And so the question is a bit, why do we see this low elasticity? Yeah? So what I do now is not so much explaining how we computed these uh, poverty figures. So if you're interested in that, then I invite you to have a look into the paper. But I, I try now to explain you know, this uh, development we see here. So let me start with the story up front, and then I try to provide the empirical evidence or to convince you of the things I put here on the slide. So what we argue is that economic growth mainly had two sources. The first is a massive migration from rural areas to urban areas. So people leaving the countryside and entering the urban labor force, mainly the informal sector, all in the informal sector. So it's a compositional effect. And the second one is agriculture growth. And that's mainly driven by land expansion, you would see. It's not so much due to a productivity increase. But I, again, I get back to this. Okay, and what we say is somehow the, both sources are not really sustainable. You would somehow expect some sort of structural shift, but that's not what we see, right? Um, and given this uh, stagnation and almost yeah, no increase in productivity in the agriculture sector, we experience quite a tremendous increase in food prices. So the gap between the consumer price index and the prices of the main food crops that are consumed by the households, and in particular for the poor households, is increasing over time, and that has quite a significant impact on the purchasing power of food. Yeah. And you will see that this food price inflation is even so important that we have some suggestive evidence, it's certainly not causal evidence, but suggestive evidence that they are health effects. We see, even over some periods, increasing child mortality. Yeah. Good, so let me start with sectoral growth. So this is uh, sectoral GDP in the aggregate, um, so not in per capita terms for the three main sectors, primary, secondary, and tertiary. You see growth in these three, in particular in the tertiary sector, um, and also a bit in the primary and secondary. But of course, what we are interested in is, how does it look like in per capita terms? So what we assume here is that, well, the primary sector that's, of course, <coughs> first of all, rural, and the secondary and tertiary sector that is, first of all, urban. So here you see the development of um, the population over time in, I mean, on the national level, that is uh, in the last line, and rural and urban areas. So we have an average uh, population growth rate of about 2% in rural areas, but in urban areas, we have, in particular more recently, we have growth rates of 7%. So also fertility is, of course, higher in rural areas, but given this high migration, you have a huge increase of the population in urban areas. Right? So we compute now the per capita terms applying these growth rates for the primary and secondary and tertiary sector, and that's a picture of what you get. So there's no growth anymore in the uh, secondary and tertiary sector. It's even, particularly in the secondary sector, it's, it's rather declining. And there's a little bit of growth in the primary sector. And you can see that better here, so this is somehow in terms of growth rates. So you see growth in the agriculture sector, 
but stagnation, if not negative growth in these two other sectors. Yeah, so that means, I mean, these people shifted to the urban areas, and of course, those who made the shift, they increased their income, but those who have always been there, there's no change in their, their income. Yeah, it's really stagnation. Um, here you see the employment patterns, yeah, that's uh, confirming that again. If you look at the urban area, there's no increase in public sector employment or formal wage employment. Yeah? It's all about still, I mean, over time in the informal sector, in the semi-urban areas, there's of course also a bit of agriculture. And in the rural area, um, it's of course, first of all, agriculture, and there's a bit of switching going on between food crop and head crop production, and that is very much uh, tied to the uh, development of the producer price for cotton. It's relatively easy, in fact, to switch to, to cotton production. But it's also declining more recently because the price is not anymore so interesting. Good. Um, so let me go to the agriculture sector. So I said there was at least some growth in the agriculture sector. So what has been the source of this? So here you see data from a, a very nice agriculture survey that is done every year in Burkina Faso. And if you look here over time, you see that the uh, production that you have in each one in the middle, that is first of all due to an expansion of land. Yeah, and there's only very little increase in land productivity. It's about 1%, the, the annual rate in the food crop sector, and in the cotton sector, it's also just 1%. But the land expansion is 7.6%. So all that growth is generated through an expansion of land. So again, this is not really sustainable. Yeah? So here's a problem. We need some you know, improvement in technology to increase that productivity. And you see that it's hitting limits because land is becoming scarce, or the land quality is deteriorating because there was a lot of use of fertilizer for the, in, in the cotton sector. You see the, the cotton price, so that was, was very interesting in the, uh, after the devaluation in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s, but then then this is not any more so interesting than it was uh, the time before. Good, so um, what about food prices? So I said there is uh, this lack of productivity increase and um, all this leads to a steady increase in food prices. So look at these figures, the bold line, this is the consumer price index, and then you have the three main food crops consumed by households, millet, sorghum, and uh, mice, and you can see, I mean, it's of course quite volatile, but over time, if you look at the trend line, there's this gap between the CPI and this, um, the prices of the food crops is really increasing every year, so it becomes more and more expensive to pay for your uh, food consumption. Yeah? And you see, there's around the CPI, there's the price of rice, so you could argue, well, is that not a substitute? No, it's not, because the price per calories is far too high. So people can't substitute to us, at least not in rural areas. So they're a bit in, in urban areas. So what does this food price inflation do? Well, it increases somehow the share of income that has to be spent on, on food crops. Again, households have very limited possibilities to substitute. And there's also no effect through the production side, because most of these households are net, pro, uh, net consumers and not net producers. So there's no, no benefit that comes from somehow selling cereals on the market. Uh, very little. So here's an exercise we had done in the, in the paper in the JDE where we somehow um, applied this debt rebellion decomposition um, where you decompose a change in poverty into a growth component and a redistribution component. And we added a third component, we call it the poverty line component. Murray had presented this yesterday for those who attended this session. So what you see here is the poverty effect of a differential in the inflation of the poverty line relative to the CPI. Yeah. So it's, it comes from a change in relative prices and the fact that the poor consume a different bundle than the, say, urban household that is underlying the CPI. And if you look over this period, 1994 to 2003, you see that growth and redistribution, in fact, reduce poverty, but then there's this huge poverty line effect. So a large part of the potential poverty reduction was offset by an increase of the prices that are relevant to the poor. And that is continuing and continuing. Yeah. Good, and I said in the beginning that we even have some evidence uh, that this uh, has health effects, and that's somehow the, the, what you see here. So that's computed with uh, demographic and health surveys. So we have uh, wasting, stunting, and also infant mortality and under five mortality. 
And for all these figures, you see even an increase in the 90s, whereas in many other countries at the time it started already to decline, and only, say, a very modest decline in the 2000s. Yeah? So it could be linked to this increase in food prices. Yeah? It's more and more expensive somehow to make the basic needs in terms of food. So this is really worrying. Good, so I come to my conclusion. So if you look over this entire period, um, then somehow we see we have on the one hand, we have this doubling of the population size between 1985 and 2010. Um, we have today 6.5 million people below the poverty line. That is even a million more than in 1994. And what we argue here is, if you do not see very soon a, a structural shift in this economy, so a higher productivity in the agriculture sector and some change also in the home labor market with higher productivity jobs, then it will be very hard not only to feed the population but also somehow to absorb these 0.3 to 0.5 million men and women that enter each year the labor force. So there's really something wrong. Of course, the next question is, so why has this structural transformation not taken place? Is it political economy, too much donor involvement? Lots of donors are in Burkina, and of course they all intervene and then somehow try to have an influence on the priorities. Is it a lack of commitment? So these are all interesting questions, probably hard to analyze, but this is somehow the, the next step, I think. And then I have a final slide, a sort of a reaction to uh, these two famous papers by Pinkowski and Salai Martin on the one hand, and then the young paper on the other. So what would they have found with their methodology on this Burkina Faso case? Would they have found the same or something different? Well, for the Pinkowski and Salai Martin case, I mean, they work with the GDP per capita, and then they take the distribution out of the GDP. So they would have found a huge reduction in poverty. Why? Because there was growth of GDP in the aggregate, and if we use the say the nominal Gini coefficient, so ignoring that relative price has changed, yeah, because the Gini is invariant to the, the general inflation rate, you would have gotten a very um, significant poverty reduction. What about Young? Young relies on this, uh, the, uh, the asset index. Well, assets are also um, increasing here, but what he assumes is that the income elasticity of asset demand is constant. Well, if you have that significant changes in the relative prices, it's very unlikely that this elasticity is constant, right? So again, you would have uh, found something different, and I think both would not be credible. Okay. That's it. Thank you.